Well, if you would, please open your Bibles with me back to 1 Thessalonians. Special thank you again to Daniel and the team. Such a wonderful set this morning that blessed my soul, and I loved hearing you all sing so loudly to the Lord. The best-selling Christian book of all time outside the Bible, I'm imagining many of you have read it, it was called The Pilgrim's Progress, written by John Bunyan, published in 1678. If you know anything about the background of it, he wrote it while he was in prison for preaching without a license in England. The main character in this book is Christian. We meet Christian when he's leaving the city of destruction and he's on a quest to try and get the burden of sin off of his back and make it to the celestial city. It's a beautiful allegory, really, portraying our Christian life. The reason I mention it to you this morning is I think we resonate so much with this book, and this is why it's so profoundly read and why it's endured through the ages. And the reason for that is chapter after chapter, page after page, you are left with this reality that Christian is on a journey, one he knows he must complete well, but along the way, as he's trying to listen to God, there's all these competing voices in his life, all these distractions that are trying to get him away from following the pilgrim's progress to the celestial city and getting him to go off track. And if you've read the book, you know that most of those voices are counterfeit voices claiming they're speaking on behalf of God, but they're actually trying to get Christian off track. We resonate with that, don't we? We resonate with the idea that we want to obey the Lord, but there's lots of other voices at times calling us away from the straight path. For example, Christian on his journey meets men like obstinate, encouraging him to be a little bit resistant to Scripture. He meets worldly wise men trying to get him to go to Vanity Fair and not be that serious about holiness. He meets pliable tempting him that he should just go with what's easiest in the moment. He doesn't need to listen to the hard things of God. He meets formalist, encouraging him, all you need to do is be about the externals and God will be pleased with you. He doesn't care about your heart. He meets hypocrisy, formalist travel companion, who tells him he can basically live however he wants because he has the grace of God. He meets talkative, trying to convince him that you don't have to really live for God, you can just talk about him a lot, and that's the same thing. He meets Mr. Byens, who tells him that religion is a means for personal gain. All of these voices were coming, speaking to Christian on behalf of God, saying, we have the path for you. But then he also has characters like Help, who show Christian the right path from the scriptures. He has the evangelist who carries the gospel that he gets saved by. He has discretion, piety, prudence, charity, all speaking to him, not to listen to those other voices, but listen to God. And then he has the interpreter that teaches him discernment. And then, of course, he has faithful and hopeful. Faithful comes after, I mean, hopeful comes after faithful is martyred. And then there's one key point in the book where he encounters Mr. Shame. And Mr. Shame wants him to make him feel real bad about how serious he's become about Christ now. And he wants him to dial it back a little. And he says to Mr. Shame this line that really captures the heart of the book. He says to Mr. Shame, on the day of judgment, I will not be asked what men thought of me, nor will I be judged by what you or the world think of me. I will be judged by God's word alone. What God says is best, though all the world be against it. End quote. Amen. We resonate with that. We resonate with these moments in our life where we're reminded what I need is the truth from Scripture. And we resonate with it most when sometimes we get tempted to listen to counterfeit voices. We struggle, do we not, beloved, to keep a true biblical north? 
It's hard for us at times to stay on the right track, especially with publishers pumping out books and preachers coming on the internet all over the place and the new this and the new that and the new view of Christ and the new view of sanctification and this new great book that everybody's reading and this new person that says they're here to speak on behalf of God. I have a word from the Lord. People come to us and say, my life's been changed by such and such thing and we grab a hold of it and we think, That doesn't seem like scripture, but maybe I'm wrong. There is always a vulnerability and a temptation for us to get off track. Think about this, beloved. As God is the one who presents truth, clarity from the scripture, Satan is always trying to come right behind that with a counterfeit that sounds like scripture, but it's not. A partial truth masquerading as a full truth. One part of doctrine put against another doctrine to pull you away from two doctrine. There's always a temptation to drift. And it can get us to a point where if we do not discern what is right, we could actually end up totally off track, like Christian a few times when he listens to the wrong voices. And his friends have to come and pull him out of the sea to spawn. And his friends have to come to keep him from despairing. And his friends have to come to help him get out of the city that's worldly. Well, I bring all that to you because in 1 Thessalonians this morning, chapter 5, we are going to encounter that same heart from the Apostle Paul. Paul is talking to a very healthy, wonderful, godly, young church. But he knows the evil one's always lurking. He knows there's always temptations in the human heart, and he's getting out ahead of it a bit here. There's no indication the Thessalonians are drifting into any false teaching here at this point. But he's concerned about them. And so let's read our text, and then we'll start talking about this a little bit more. We're going to start in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 19. Maybe a passage that many of you have wondered what it means for a long time. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances. But by contrast, examine everything carefully is the idea. And when you do, hold fast to that which is good and abstain from every form of evil or every kind of evil is a better translation. Now, if you've encountered this passage before, you probably know there's quite a bit of debate on its meaning. There's a lot of ink that's been spilled and a lot of trees have died. I assure you, I read about every commentary you could read this week on the meaning of this passage. Many people come to this passage because it talks about prophecy, and they say, I know what's happening. Paul is talking to the Thessalonians the same way he talked to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. The Thessalonians must have been abusing the miraculous gifts like the Corinthians. That's a mistake. That view is totally foreign to this context. There's nothing about the Thessalonians that indicates they're anything like the Corinthians abusing the miraculous gifts. So that's not what's going on here. You would have to read something into this passage to make it mean that. The other thing people do when they come to this passage, and I want you to look at it, is they'll take it as three independent commands. They'll take verse 19 as a command about the Spirit, independent of anything else. Verse 20 as a command about prophetic utterances. And verse 21 and 22 as commands about discernment. Here's the problem with that. In the original language, in the Greek text, this is not three different verses or three different sentences. This is one sentence. If you look at it, the NASB starts well and tries to do this. And in 19, they put a semicolon after do not quench the spirit. But then in 20, they do do not despise prophetic utterances, period. And then it says F21 and 22 are a new idea. But if you'd have been the original reader, and all you would have had is a Koine a Greek, a copy of the letter that came from Paul, you would have seen this is just one sentence with a beginning and a period at the end of 22. It starts in 19 and ends in 22. I actually couldn't find a single translation but one that did not mess with the passage and let it just be comma, semicolon, comma, semicolon, period. And that was the Legacy Standard Bible, so it wins the day today. As the best translation for this passage. It has its start in 19, and then the sentence ends in 22. 
You say, okay, pastor, why in the world do we need to spend that much time thinking about the grammar in this passage? Because everything he says in 19 relates to 20. Everything he says in 20 relates to 19. Everything he says in 19 and 20 relates to 21 and 22. It is one single unit of thought. And so to take any of these out from that context, you do them a dishonor on the main point Paul's making. So what is the point he's making? What what is the Apostle Paul concerned about? Well, I'll tell you quite simply. He's concerned that when the church receives, I'll talk about this more in a moment, prophecy, scripture, that they discern what is true and what is false. And when they discern what is true and what is false, his concern then is if it is true that they respond the right way, and if it is false, they respond the right way. He's calling the church to become discerning, but not just discerning and proud so they could stand over other people. Discerning and humble, because when they hear the truth, he's very concerned that if it is the truth, if it is true prophecy, they respond rightly. The entire passage is about the Spirit's work through the Word and how we're to respond. How the prophets work through the Word and how do we respond. And when we hear someone teaching, how do we reject what is evil and hold fast to what is good. Everything about this passage is our relationship to Scripture, discerning what is right and what is false, and then responding correctly. This passage comes right down to, beloved, what I said with Christian in the Pilgrim's Progress, making sure you discern the right voices in your life and you compare them to Scripture and you listen to those. And when you do, you better not reject the wrong voices, excuse me, the right voices and believe the wrong ones or he's concerned you're going to end up way off track. Notice just really quickly, verse 21, but it says, examine everything carefully. Examine what carefully? Well, he's going to talk about the way the Spirit in 19 is working through the Word and prophetic utterances are coming. They are to be examined carefully. Now, we need to talk about prophecy for a second. Because if you're going to understand this passage, you're going to have to understand prophecy then and how that relates to how we think about it now. The passage says, just look at it, do not despise, look close at it, prophetic utterances. It does not say do not despise prophets, It says, do not despise prophecies in the original. So it's talking about the variety of ways that prophecy came to the church. This is important. We're in the mid-50s here. 1 Thessalonians is one of the first, probably the first letter that we have written. Prophecy is very much still happening in the early church. And what is prophecy? In summary, prophecy was giving the people of God scripture. Sometimes we think prophecy, prophet, and we think future. A prophet is foretelling the future. That's one of the functions of prophecy. But prophets also reminded God's people of the past and reminded them again on what they needed to remember. And prophecy was also not just the future, like Agabus, when he told Paul in Acts 21, you're going to be bound in Jerusalem, or the Old Testament prophecies looking forward to the Messiah. But prophecy was also scripture given in the moment that it was given, at the time it was given. It was just scripture. It didn't always have to be the future. It didn't have to be telling somebody in the past. It could just be right in the moment, God revealing his mind and heart to his people. And prophecies came both audibly and they came in written form. Your scripture, your New Testament, your Old Testament was the unfolding of prophetic words to God's people. Scripture being spoken. So imagine now living in a time When men like Peter and Paul and James and the prophets and the apostles and men were giving actual prophecy that was scripture, you would want to listen to them to receive scripture because now you're hearing from your maker, you're hearing from God, the New Testament is being written and unfolded and you're going to want to receive that because that's God speaking to you. But guess what Satan's always doing? Sending other people claiming their prophets claiming they have prophecy, claiming they have a word from the Lord, claiming that they have studied under so-and-so and and they're going to speak to you. And he's calling the church to be discerning when you receive someone that says they're speaking on behalf of God. A prophet speaks on behalf of God. In fact, look at 2 Peter 1, 
just to show you how prophecy is scripture being revealed. It's both future, it can be the past, and it can be right in the moment when scripture's coming. 2 Peter 1, written 10 or so years after the first Thessalonians letter was written. Nevertheless, it's good for us to see prophecy just spoken about as a parallel to scripture. 2 Peter 1, look at verse 17. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, 2 Peter 1, 17, such as utterances as this were made by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased, talking about the transfiguration, and we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain, and now watch this in 19. Even though we heard the audible voice of God, now that we're revealing scripture, look what he says, 19. We have, look, the prophetic word, the unfolding of the rest of the New Testament, made more sure, notice, to which you do will do well to pay attention to as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Look at verse 20, prophecy again. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture, that's the unfolding of revelation, is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. The Spirit working through the word to give scripture. So at this time, these men, these people, these churches were receiving scripture. And when it was true scripture, they were to respond rightly. But if it was false, they were to discern it and reject it. And the reason that this is important for us today, I'll talk about in a moment, is there's parallels. But we also need to understand that while there may not be modern prophets today and prophecies, we still have many people that claim they speak on behalf of God and they're distorting the true prophecy of Scripture. I'll talk about that in a moment. But let me close the loop on something here real quickly. Prophecies were very active, and they, the miraculous gifts, tongues and healing and prophecies and apostles, they were active during the New Testament time until a day came when they were no longer needed because God has revealed his mind and heart to his people, and he no longer had to give them revelation because they had enough, enough to be proper worshipers of him. You say, what passage says that? 1 Corinthians 13, 8 to 10. Just listen to it. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there's knowledge, they'll be done away with. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, listen to verse 10, but when the mature, teleos, the complete comes, the partial will be done away with. Once the New Testament church in 91 AD, when John wrote Revelation, had a completed canon, and all the apostles and prophets had died off, and he was the last remaining one, God decided the church of Jesus Christ and God's people had mature, complete, sufficient revelation to worship him. And there was no longer a need for ongoing future prophecies and revelations. We have the more sure word. So how do we you know, think through a passage like this? Go back to our text now. Turn back to 1 Thessalonians. Now that we've got a little survey on prophecy. Go back to 1 Thessalonians 5. Please turn over there. We may not have modern day, actual, real, biblical prophets revealing scripture, but we have a whole lot of people, as I mentioned a little bit ago, that claim to speak on behalf of God. In fact, I today claim to speak on behalf of God in that I'm speaking from his word. And that means even me today, as you're listening to it, everything I say that I'm speaking, you should ask yourself, is that coming from the text? Is that coming from the word of God? Or is this just some counterfeit mouthpiece that's leading us into stray and going outside of scripture? There is seminaries today whose president emeritus is Satan and they export air. There's publishing companies owned by the evil one, and all they do is export air. There is so-called pastors, so-called preachers, so-called apostles, so-called prophets that you can turn on the radio, you can turn on the TV, and they're going to say to you, we've got a word from the Lord. 
we need to be just as discerning to examine everything that is said by Scripture. It is the standard. It is fixed. It is immovable. And all people come under it. And so just as much as Paul was concerned that this church fall to counterfeit preaching, counterfeit false teaching, and fall into error, we need to also be careful that we're not deceived by listening to the wrong voices and not discerning them. You can say, could that really happen? I mean, we've got lots of good teaching and I've got a good background. Well, I mean, it happened to some churches that had Paul teach them, Peter teach them. They had the apostles there and they still swallowed some of it down. See, sometimes our flesh is so attracted to counterfeit teaching because it just puts so much less demand on our life. Our flesh is so drawn into a little bit different Christ, a little bit different sanctification, a little bit different view of the Spirit, because it's just more comfortable for me. Our flesh gets drawn in. And don't you think Satan knows that? Why would Satan craft a false teaching that didn't attract the flesh? Every single false teaching that distorts Scripture targets something about your heart that's vulnerable. And so we need to be in this text. We need to think it through. So how are we going to think through this? What's what's our mode we're going to approach this today? Well, here's going to be our outline. We'll give it to you up front. You can write it down, and then we'll just walk through it the rest of this morning. Three steps to take when we hear someone claim to speak on behalf of God. Three steps to take when we hear someone claim to speak on behalf of God. And I say steps because I really see this text unfolding backwards in a way that captures it all together. Remember, one Greek sentence. So every single person you hear or every book you read or anything somebody hands you or any person that says, you got to hear this guy on this podcast. You got to hear this preacher. You got to read this book, this new thing, whatever. You have a, a command from the Lord on how you're to respond. Three steps we take when we hear someone claim to speak on behalf of God. And that means everyone, every time you hear someone claim to speak on behalf of God, including being discerning like the Bereans when Paul was in Acts 17 speaking or when I speak today. Everything I say should be submitted to Scripture, period. So, step one. We're going to work backwards from 21 to 22. Step one, when someone claims they're speaking on behalf of God, And that could be a genuine speaker for God, or it could be a false speaker claiming to speak on behalf of God. Step one is this. Step one is examine it against Scripture. Quite simple. When someone comes and claims to speak on behalf of the Lord, very simply examine what they say against Scripture. We're going to start in 21 and 22 and work our way backwards. Notice verse 21. Here is your first step. Notice what it says. Examine Look, I'm in 21, everything carefully. It's the word dakimazo. It's the, it's the word that um, is describing in, in, the, in, the, in the Greek tongue the idea of examining something to prove it's genuine. To, to examine something to make sure it's useful, to make sure it's not a counterfeit. And when you're examining something, you have to examine it by a standard. And what's assumed here is that when prophecies would have come to them or someone claiming they're speaking on behalf of God, everything that man said to them, they would have said, is that consistent with Scripture? Is that consistent with what the Older Testament says? Is that consistent with what we know what the apostles' teaching? They would have had much less Scripture than we do. Again, first letter unfolded in the New Testament. The gospel letters are just starting to float around. So they would have had to examine everything they knew by the base that they had. We even have more revelation to examine it against. And nevertheless, they were to examine it carefully. Literally, the idea means to scrutinize, to look at it and evaluate it and think it through. There's no lazy Christians in this passage. It's a call to be discerning. It's not a call to be skeptical. It's not a call to be suspicious. It's a call to be discerning. Sometimes we have these discernment ministries out there and it's like a license for someone to sit, you know, like the the Sunday morning armchair quarterback and sit back in pride and say, pastor better prove that to me. It's not a call to pride. It's a call to humility that says, I want to hear that and I want to come under it if it's from the text and I want to make sure it's from the text and I want to make sure it's from God and if it is, I'm coming under it. But if it's not, I will reject it. 
It's humility, not pride. And it's interesting when we think about this, we have to also add that God does gift pastors and teachers, Ephesians 4, 11, and 12, with unique gifts to feed the church, to help protect the church from error. That's what shepherds do. But even in that, those men, me, our men, we're not infallible, still must be examined by Scripture. We need to be testing, examining everything that is said. So really, this becomes a life verse for you, beloved. Anything you receive that claims to be speaking on behalf of God, book, magazine, podcast, blog, sermon, you name it, the call here is examine it against Scripture. And when you examine it against Scripture, if you determine, yep, that's coming from the Lord. I see it in the Bible. I see it from the word of God. That's definitely from the Lord. Then you have an obligation, notice in 21, to hold fast to it. I'll talk about that more in a moment. But if you examine it and you look at it and you scrutinize it and you examine and it doesn't look like it's coming from God and it doesn't come from the scripture, notice 22, you abstain from every form of evil. You know what this sounds like? 1 John 4.1, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they're from God. The testing criteria is asking the question, is this teaching, is this prophetic word, is this scripture from the Lord or not? And you gotta look close at the text. There's a play on words. Notice those two ideas there. One is after you've done an examination, you either hold fast in 21 in the middle of the text there, or 22, you abstain. That's actually the same root verb, echo, to have. And so the idea is this. um, If it is biblical teaching, have it, hold it, grip it, clutch it, hold on to it. If you receive something that is scripture, you be as zealous to hold on to that and grab it and clutch it to your chest as fast as you can, as formidably as you can, put it in your heart, memorize it in your mind, hold it, grip it. Deuteronomy 32, 47 comes to mind when Moses says, these are not idle words, they're your life. If you discern that you've heard from the Lord, from a pulpit, from a book, from preaching, you just say, I need to grab a hold of that. That's truth from my God. But then he uses the same verb and says, not only hold fast, he puts a different preposition on it and he says, hold one away. So you hold fast, hold one close, and you hold one away. Same verb. So the second there, notice the text, if it is air, you don't hold it fast, hold it close, grip it, clutch it. Notice 22, you abstain from it. You hold it away from it. You stay aloof from it. If you determine something is counterfeit and air, you reject it. You keep it away from you. And I ask you, beloved, we sometimes have this idea, and I can appreciate it, When we say, hey, I'm going to read this guy that I don't totally agree with. I'm not totally on the same page. He has this air and that air, but I really like this and I really like that. I'm going to eat the meat, spit out the bones. How many bones does it take to choke? How much poison does it take to kill you? I'm not saying everyone you read, you're going to be right where they're at. There's going to be plenty of people you're going to read and listen to. I may say things where you think there's something theologically, some view uh, application I have that's a little bit different from you. I understand that. But I'm talking about when we start flirting with and reading and listening to people that are full of air because there's something about it we like. You notice... Paul doesn't say, be neutral about it. You know, embrace what is good, but when something's bad, do the postmodern thing. We need to be tolerant of error. Really? Paul actually says, reject it and call it evil. Look at it. If you examine something carefully and it's not legitimate, you abstain from every form of evil. Form there is is, uh, the word for kind of evil, every manifestation of evil. I know sometimes we've used this verse to say, hey, we need to be careful to watch out for the appearance of evil in our life. And I can appreciate careful testimonies, but he's not talking about potential evil. He's talking about teaching and false teaching and error that's actual evil. And he says, don't be neutral about it. Don't hang back from it. You reject it if it is evil. Quite literally, it is substantively evil. 
evil. And he doesn't say just one kind, any type of evil that distorts scripture and is false teaching, pone race, it's wicked, it's evil, it's sick, it's worthless. I think we are vulnerable in a, in a postmodern, secular society that feeds us the idea that love is tolerance. Love is compassion. Love is graciousness to people. Love is loving the unlovely. But love never, ever, ever is tolerant of error. Love is intolerant of error because you love people too much to want them to embrace that error. Love rejoices in truth and hates unrighteousness. We need to look at this text and see that Paul doesn't say just reject it. It is evil. Reject it as evil. There's a lot of teachings today that I can't get into, and so I've decided next week, because I don't have an evening service, so next week you're going to get it. I'm going to do the whole service and talk about different teachings from the Scripture that have manifestations of evil that typically deceive God's people. And we're going to talk through those next week, so I'll leave it there for now. But I think it's good for us to see that the first thing we need to do, our first step, our first exercise, when we hear someone speaking on behalf of God, is examine it against Scripture. If it's genuine and it's true and it's from God, you swallow that down whole and you get it in your life and you apply it. If it's not, call it evil. Reject it. Don't be neutral towards it. Don't play with poison. Don't play with fire. Don't choke on bones. Reject it. It's false. So that's the first thing we do. Second, second step. If the first step is to examine it against Scripture, the next two steps have to do with us landing on that it is from God. You see, if you understand 21 and 22 work in relationship to, um, to 19 and 20, it really be- makes the passage come alive now. So your next points go like this. If you discern the teaching that you received is from God, here's your two commands. Don't quench the spirit and don't despise prophetic utterance. If you discern something you receive is from the Lord, now you know what to do with it. And so that's our next two steps. Step two, then. Step two is this. If you have discerned that the teaching is from God, do not despise it. I'm back in 20. I'm just working my way backwards in the text. If 21 has happened and I've examined it carefully and I've found that this is good and life-giving, then verse 20 says, do not despise the prophetic utterances. Do not despise when you receive scripture. Now you may say, that is such a weird command. I love scripture. I enjoy scripture. I sit under sermons because I love scripture. In fact, isn't this church known and notorious in the scriptures for being a church that loved the word of God and received it wholeheartedly? Look at chapter one, verse 13. Yes, they are. Excuse me. Chapter two, verse 13. Turn over one. Look at what he says about their reception of scripture, which is prophecy. For this reason, We also constantly thank God that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the words of men, but you accepted it for what it really was, the word of God, which performs its work in you who believe. This church's reputation was that when true prophecies came, they took it for what it was, from God. So why the command to not despise scripture? I mean, and despise is a strong word. It literally means treat the scripture with contempt. Quite literally, for prophecy to come, it means to reject it, to be against it, to think little of it. It seems like a strange command until you start thinking about it in context. Now, think with me about this. There's, if, we, if we just categorize this word of despising, rejecting, thinking little of something, there's a couple different ways you can reject somebody or something, can't you? There's a number of different ways you can despise something or somebody. Let's just envision I had a friend that I no longer liked anymore. I wasn't being very nice. I could look at that friend and say, you know what? I despise you. I reject you. I'm done with you. I could proactively say that to that friend, right? There's also another way I could reject that friend. I could have another friend come over here 
that wants to be my friend. And I could say nothing to this friend over here. And rather than saying it to their face that I'm going to reject you, I could just turn my back on it and choose this other friend. I'm sending the same message, rejection, even though I said nothing. Now think about the context. What if someone came in with prophecies that went against the teaching of Paul, the teaching of Peter, the teaching of the apostles? What if someone came in and said, in Galatia, hey, you need to go back to circumcision and having right footing with God by the law. Or Hebrews, you know what? We need to go back to the ceremonial system. Jesus isn't enough. Or in Colossians, you know what? That teaching on sanctification, you guys aren't focused enough on the externals. What if someone came in this time and started teaching something contrary to what the apostles had taught? These believers may not say, I reject Paul. They may just turn with their actions and choose the false teaching. And in doing it, they despise scripture. The call here is not to embrace error and in doing that, treat scripture with contempt. You know, this was Corinth's big problem. And it is interesting that when Paul's writing this letter, he's writing from Corinth. So maybe he's a little bit concerned the Thessalonians are gonna become like them. Do you remember what Paul told the Corinthians? Why he was so burdened about them in 2 Corinthians? Listen to this. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus, 2 Corinthians 11, who we have not preached, and you receive a different spirit which you've not received, or a different gospel which you've not accepted, listen to this, you bear it beautifully. You swallow it down, you take it in, and you act like it is the best stuff you've heard. And in doing that, you tell the Apostle Paul and the rest of the disciples, be quiet. What is that? Despising the text. What does this prove to us? God takes it very seriously how we respond to Scripture. And God takes it very seriously how much we flirt with air. And God takes it very seriously if we've been taught something orthodox. He takes it very seriously if we turn away from orthodoxy to air. He views that turning away from truth to air as despising and rejecting his word. Could a believer do this? Sure. They did it in Galatia. Did it probably a little bit in 1 John. Maybe a little in Colossians. Bit in the Hebrews. Man, the Corinthians sure did it. They ran Paul out of town. Listen, this is a healthy church. He's getting ahead of this thing. You guys need to be careful that you don't despise scripture in the name of taking in air. So what's the contrast then? The contrast is not despising prophecy, but loving it, receiving it, embracing it. Let me, let me ask you something, beloved. What kind of reception does scripture have with you? When the word of God is being taught and you're convinced it's from God, does the word of God have a place where it can just land in your heart with no resistance? Where you just take it in? Or is there sometimes a tension in you that doesn't want to take it in and sometimes you like lighter teaching or softer teaching or easier teaching? Beloved, this ought not to be. We need to be careful. If it's truly from God, I don't care how much it cuts, how much it hurts, how much it exposes, we don't want to be caught despising scripture by turning away from it. So he says, don't despise prophetic utterance. So that's our second step. So first step, examine it against scripture. If it's truly from God, second step, if it's from God, don't despise it. Don't turn to air. Don't turn to anything else. Embrace the scriptures. Here's the last step. Third step. If it is true, don't extinguish it. Look back in the text. Verse 19, I'm working my way up the text. Now keep the same, we're building 21 and 22 is just pushing us back to 20 and 19. Do not quench the spirit. This is probably my favorite thing I'm gonna get to teach you this morning. This is such wonderful, encouraging language about the spirit's work in our life through the word of God. Remember, the topic in this sentence is, is about true scripture coming and when it comes, receiving it. And if it's false uh, prophecy, if it's false teaching, if it's a distortion of scripture, rejecting it. Well, in verse 19, we're talking about when you receive true scripture 
by the Spirit's work. Remember back in 2 Peter 1, men move by the Spirit. And when he's talking about Spirit here, he's not talking about just our Spirit. Sometimes we'll talk about us and our personhood. He's talking about the person of the Holy Spirit and the way he works in your life. And here's what's amazing. The metaphor he's using when he uses the word quench there, it's the idea to extinguish. It's always used to speak of a fire burning, a flame burning. So think of the imagery just as we move into this next point. Your third step is if the scripture is true, don't extinguish it. It's like the Apostle Paul's um, helping you look at your heart and he's helping you envision that your heart is a place where the Spirit's taken up residency if you're a Christian. If you've put your faith in Christ, repented of your sins, trusted in Christ for salvation, the third person of the Trinity takes up residency in your inner life. Amazing. Well, the residency here of the Spirit is like a flame that's burning. It's a fire. Literally, we would be putting out the fire, extinguishing it. So the idea is it's, it does what fire does. It brings heat. It brings light. It brings exposure. It brings clarity. We add that and play that metaphor out. It brings conviction. It brings encouragement. So he's, he's kind of presenting this idea that the Holy Spirit's work in your heart is like a flame that can never go out. Once you're saved, you cannot be lost. There's no losing the Spirit. The Spirit doesn't take up residency in you and then leave. If you are saved, you are born again, you cannot be lost. There's no losing your salvation. There's no losing the spirit. But you can have an environment in your heart where that flame of the spirit that could burn bright doesn't get so much room to burn because there's a lot of dampness in there in your heart. You're extinguishing the spirit's work. You're extinguishing the way the word wants to work in your heart by the environment that flame is in. And if you think about fire for a second, fire is always extinguished or put out by something outside of it. So the spirit comes into our heart, takes up residency, that's the fire. Well, fire is put out by water, fire is put out by wind, fire could be put out by a blanket. There is exterior things that hinder the work of the spirit. Paul uses similar language in Ephesians 4, do not grieve the spirit. So that's kind of the inner life that you're being given here. So let's think it through a little bit with the metaphor. The idea of the quenching of the spirit or putting out the fire of the spirit, just to give you some more language of it, this idea of fire or quenching is used all through your scriptures to make this metaphor come alive. For example, in Acts 2, they were speaking the word and the spirit came like as a fire. Matthew 3.11, Isaiah 4.4 speaks of the spirit working through the word being like fire. But then Isaiah 42.3, who I would imagine might have been on Paul's mind, speaks about how that flame can pee just like a barely small burning wick of a candle. You remember Isaiah 42.3, and the smoldering wick he will not put out. That flame can get real low. It's there, you can't lose it, but it can get real low. So the idea is don't extinguish the spirit burning fire that God has put into your heart. Don't put out the holy, the the fire of the Holy Spirit in you. And what I'm not talking about is mystical passion. I'm talking about how the scripture works in the heart with a believer when they're submitting to it. This is about receiving scripture. You know what it's reminiscent of when you think about the word of God working through the spirit of God and it working in your heart? And we'll have to ask Paul when we get to heaven if these passages were on his mind. But it makes me think of Jeremiah 23, 9, where Jeremiah the prophet says, is your word not like fire? There it is. Or Jeremiah 20, verse 9, where where, uh, Jeremiah says, the word of God is like a fire shut up in my bones. I cannot contain it. Believer, you know that. You know what it's like to have the Spirit of God working in your heart with a clean conscience and the Word of God coming into your heart and you're hearing it and it's like the Spirit is bringing heat (laughs) inside of you. You know where else this shows up? The road to Emmaus. You remember that? The disciples, Luke 24, 
They get to hear from the risen Savior, Jesus, and they're walking with him, and he's explaining to them how the Old Testament speaks to to him. And you remember what it says about them when they state that conversation? Listen to it. Were our hearts not burning fire within us when the Lord talked to us, when you, when you, excuse me, when you opened the scriptures to us? I mean, what believer has not been sitting under a truth, sitting under a sermon, and when someone's preaching or they're reading something, it's like they feel like the road to Emmaus. They feel like, man, Lord, you're talking to me, and that flame is, is, is high. That's the work of the Spirit in the heart, through illumination, through clarity. This is what God does. But this is not telling us to fan that flame. This is telling us that flame of the Spirit wants to burn bright. Don't extinguish it. Don't put it out. So what could we do to create an environment to put out the work of the Spirit through the Word in our heart? Well, I'll tell you, sin. Unconfessed, unrepentant sin and a guilty conscience will make that flame get pretty low. One commentator says this. I think it's really good. He says, lost my place here. Promise I'll get there. There it is. The general character of this prohibition would certainly leave room for a wider interpretation. Anything that might be permitted in their assembly or their own hearts, which was contrary to the nature and work of the Spirit, would quench its operation. The Spirit's fire is quenched, listen, whenever his presence is ignored and his promptings are suppressed and rejected, or the fervor he kindles in the heart is dampened by unspiritual attitudes, criticisms, or actions. This all quenches the Spirit's working in their midst. They must not allow the operation of the Spirit to be suppressed either through, by yielding to the impulses of the flesh, end quote. So let's think about the metaphor for a second, beloved. A damp soul that's wet with the residue of undealt with sin is a bad environment for that spirit flame to burn bright. So I'll ask you, is your inner life a place where the spirit has room to bring heat, light, clarity, warmth, conviction, encouragement? Is your inner life a place where the spirit's work through his word can burn bright because you're dealing with your sin? Or is your heart a place dampened by the residue of unconfessed, unrepented bitterness, anger, resentment, fear, Whatever sins you're hold on to, just know that you're limiting the Spirit's work in your life. You can't stop the Spirit. Spirit's coming, and God's coming. John 16, 8, the Spirit convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment. God will come for his people. He will discipline. He will shepherd. He, he will break hips if he needs to, Hebrews 12. God will come. You will limp, but he will come. But do we, any of us really want that? Do we want to live a life like a fool of corrective discipline all of our life? Or do we want an environment in our inner life with a clean conscience where we're keeping short accounts with our sin, where we're going to the scriptures, where we're humble in heart, so anytime the word of God connects with the spirit of God and works in my heart, that flame just goes higher with excitement to serve the Lord, a devotion and a passion to serve the Lord. It flows out of a clean conscience. Everything in this passage is about responding to Scripture, beloved. So, do you want to be like those disciples on the road to Emmaus? Because I do. <laughs> when you hear Scripture, it fills your heart. Don't you have those moments where you're like, this is what the Lord wanted to say to me today. I needed that, and I thank the Lord for that. Encouragement. But you can also rejoice with conviction, because conviction means that your heart's ready to receive whatever God has for you. I mean, I think when I sit under preaching... I hope I leave saying I was very encouraged and I was massively convicted. What a good Sunday. I don't need someone telling me it's my best life now every week. I want someone to preach the text to my heart. And I want to have my heart at such a place under the word that the spirit 
fan, the flame of the Spirit can burn bright. And you could think about it this way. The flames in your heart, Scripture makes it burn higher. A clean conscience makes it burns higher. A, a devoted life to God's glory, a humble submission to the truth. Everything, every way you bend your life to the Word of God, the Spirit has room to just work. So no, you can't lose the Spirit, but you can certainly limit the flame. So, in review, our time is gone. You sit under teaching that claims to be from God. You read teaching that claims to be from God. The first thing you do is examine it by Scripture. If it's not from the Lord, reject it as evil. If it is from the Lord, accept it, clutch it, grab it, hold on to it. And if it's from the Lord, don't despise it by looking at error instead of truth. And if it's from the Lord... Have an environment in your heart where the Spirit can use the Word to convict and encourage you all the time because you're keeping a clean life. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we rejoice over such a simple passage with so much clarity. We have clear wisdom from you on how to approach every time we hear teaching from your Word. May we be a discerning people, not turning to error. May we be a convicted people that come under your truth. May our hearts be places where the Spirit can burn bright with clarity, conviction, precision. May we be like those disciples. May we not be like the Corinthians who could hardly hear from Paul because they were so hard-hearted. And may we never despise true teaching. May we accept it fully. And Lord, protect our people from the evil one. He is so much smarter than us so much more deceptive. He's been doing this for thousands of years. So keep us from the evil one and let messages like this and next week keep us a discerning people. In your name we pray.